Hello! A while back, I made a video about this little dongle that you can plug in the floppy drive port of your Amiga, and it was supposed to protect all drives against boot block viruses. During that video, I discovered that if data was being written using the operating system routines, it works as expected, although in some situations it could cause data corruption. Worse still, I discovered that if by skipping the operating system and writing directly using the hardware, you could actually bypass any protection this device offered completely. In this video, we're going to take a look at this somewhat looking more complex device, the Rocktech Rock Knight Antivirus Box, that's supposed to offer a similar or maybe superior level of protection. So, let's take a look. Before we try it out, let's see what we can find out about it, because I don't have the box or the manual that should have come with it. The first time I can find any information about this was the Amiga User International August 1991 Volume 5 Issue 8, when the product is officially announced. At this point, we get no indication of cost and they're looking for dealers and distributors. There then seems to be a bit of a gap for this product for a few years, and it next appears in Amiga World February 1993, in a small advert at the bottom of a page, listed as retailing for $30. Now, I'm guessing this product wasn't too popular, because in Amiga Shopper issue 37 from May 1994, we find the Rocktech Rock Knight listed under End of Line Products for a whopping £2.99. And to prove that wasn't a mistake, taking a look at Amiga Format issue 60 from June 1994, one month later, we find a nearly identical advert from the same company selling the Rocktech at rock bottom prices. Oh dear. So, it only took four years to get dropped as a product. That's not really filling me with any confidence. Anyway, as mine didn't come with a box, I've decided to have a look online and I've found these photos of what you should have got. Not much, as it happens, the main device and a few bits of paper. Hmm. The back of the box is quite interesting though, as it gives us a little bit more information about what the device actually does, which looks like it can force all disks to be right protected or just protect track zero where the boot block is. It can also make a beeping sound if you try to write to track zero. Now I can think of a couple of reasons why this might not have sold very well. Firstly, you needed a second floppy drive for this to be useful at all. Secondly, by 1994, Amiga 600s and 1200s with hard drives inside were more commonplace, so floppy disks probably were getting used less. However, I suspect the most likely reason is that most people just assume they won't get a virus, so don't worry about it. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's take a look at the device. So here it is, up close and personal, and we can see it has a track display. Then next to it, a button to control write protection and a button to control writing to track zero. With both buttons switched off, it doesn't do anything, although it will make a beep sound when something writes to track zero. With protect switched on, it will make a beep sound if you attempt to write to track zero on any drive, but only the external one is protected from being written to. With the virus button on, it again warns us by making a beep, but also blocks writing to track zero. It doesn't say if this is for all drives or just the internal one. Lastly, with both pressed, the external one is protected from write access, but boot blocks are also protected in all drives. So onwards, and as you'd expect, it uses the standard Amiga 23 pin floppy connector. And on the back, we can see where we connect our external floppy drive to. Before I plug it in, I just want to give a quick shout out to my Patreons. And if you want to become a Patreon to help support the channel, then the link is on screen and in the video description. Onwards to testing. So, I've connected it up along with an external floppy drive, and I've booted into Workbench from the A590 hard drive on the left. Now, to make it easier to see what I'm doing, I'm going to overlay these as well. Much better. Right, on to some tests. To start with, I have both the buttons, Protect and Virus, turned off. So, in this state, it should provide no protection at all. Let's quick format a disk and see what happens, firstly from the internal drive. I'll be speeding this up in places so you don't have to wait. Did you hear that beep? That beep came from the Rock Knight device, and it was telling us something wrote to the boot block on a drive somewhere. Now I'll repeat this with the external drive. I love how the track number is shown, it's really cool, although in some ways it's completely pointless. Formatting, and yep, the same beep. So the next test, I'll press the protect button. This is supposed to prevent writing to the disks in the external drive only. Let's see what happens. Excellent, so it allowed writing to the internal drive, 
and it made the operating system think that the external one was write protected, exactly what the instructions said it would. Let's move on to the virus mode. Once again, I'm going to try and format the disk, starting with the internal drive. And as it claimed it would, it prevented us from formatting track 0, stating the disk was write protected. Let's try the external drive. Same again. Excellent, but in this mode we should be able to write files to the disk, so let's try that, starting with the internal drive. And some of you may have spotted I've changed the mouse. It would appear my previous mouse needs some servicing in the button department. So, copying a file over, and yes, the file is copying over perfectly. Now for the external drive, and I'm using the same disk. I do want to replace the file. Um, it's write protected? That's not right, this should allow writing here. Let's try removing and reinserting the disk in case it's got a little confused. That's better, seems to have fixed it. So it's a little bit glitchy then I guess. Maybe ejecting a disk is the floppy equivalent of, have you tried turning it off and on again? So onto the fourth test, with both of the buttons pressed. This shouldn't allow writing to track zero on either drive and the external one should be totally protected. Firstly, testing the internal drive with a format. That failed as expected. Now trying to copy a file. Well, it's not supposed to protect the internal one from writing, but it seems to have. Hmm. Let's test the external drive starting again with the disk format. Well, that's failed as expected. Let's try and copy a file. That's also failed. Excellent. OK, so, so far it's doing mostly what it's supposed to with a little bit of inaccuracy regarding the internal drive. The next thing I want to check is if this can corrupt files just like the simple switch version does when the disk starts to become full. Track 0 isn't just for the boot block, it also contains parts of files too. My plan is to put the device into virus mode, meaning it will block writing to the boot block of the disk. So, let's see what happens. Firstly, again with the internal drive, and I've formatted this disk in FFS mode, and I'm going to copy some files onto it to see what happens. All seems OK with the first file, let's try another one. So far so good, on to the third. Ah, a write error on disk block 11. Well, that is on track 0. I'll hit the retry button and see what happens. Now block 22, that's on the other side. There's never going to be a boot block there, so this isn't checking the side of the disk. Hmm, not a great start. So, this confirms it isn't just protecting the boot block, it's protecting the entire first track on both sides of the disk. For the sake of completeness, I'll test the external drive too. Once again, I've formatted this disk completely blank, and I'll start by copying some files onto it. And as you can see the disk slowly being written to, starting around track 40, I'll keep adding files, and you'll notice as it hits track 79, it rolls back to track 0, and then we get the error. So at a quick glance, this is behaving exactly like the cheapo adapter I had before. OK, so that's some of the workbench tests done, and at the OS level it appears to offer the same sort of protection. Now if you remember the simple dongle device I had before, it also passed these tests, but I did manage to bypass it. So let's do some low level tests. Now I don't expect it to provide any better protection for the internal drive than the simple dongle did, but I do wonder if, because it sits physically between the Amiga and the external drive, if it actually offers proper write protection and not just a fake write protect signal. So let's get my nasty AMOS program started and we'll give it a try. Now I know there's easier environments to do this with, but as I already have this AMOS program from last time, I thought I'd reuse it. This program uses the Amiga's hardware to instruct a DMA write to the floppy drive. It's doing exactly what the OS is doing, except that it won't bother to check the write protect status first. Now if the disk is actually physically write protected, it's impossible to write to the disk, as the drive itself will block it. But this device, at least for the internal drive, will be faking a write protect signal, meaning it should be able to bypass it. And as you can see, after the programs ran, Workbench can't recognise the disk anymore. So once again, at least for the internal drive, the Rock Knight offers no real protection. Now on to the more interesting test, the external drive. Now writing to a disk is controlled by two wires, one called write gate and one called write data. Enabling write gate is what enables the writing. If you start the disk spinning and just enable write gate, then you'll actually erase the current track. Without that set, it doesn't matter what you send on the write data wire, nothing will happen. So what I'm hoping to see here is that the device is not just faking a write protect, but it's actually physically locking out the write gate line, preventing writing to the disk. So let's test it. 
once again starting with a clean formatted disc. So you can see it's seeking back to track 0, then the beep as I try to write to the disc. Let's see if I manage to bypass it. Dropping back to workbench and reinserting the disc. Wow! No, I didn't! So this provides proper protection for the external drive connected to this thing. That's amazing! Now, this got me thinking. I can connect a further drive to the back of DF1, giving us DF2. I wonder if it will provide the same level of protection for that one as well. So, let's give it a try. OK, inserting a nice clean blank disc again, and the first thing I notice is it doesn't show the track number. I suppose that's not really a surprise, I guess it only does it for DF1. Now onto Amos, and I've modified this for DF2, which is why it's currently sitting at the completed program screen. I've got to test this stuff works, right? Anyway, pressing go, and it's seeking to track zero as before, then a beep to say a write was attempted, and checking in workbench, the disk is unmodified, so this protects all external drives properly. OK, so we now know exactly what it does. The next thing I'd like to see is how it actually does it, and that means pulling it apart. And I'm excited to learn exactly what's inside and how it works. And if you like learning, then this video sponsor Brilliant is a perfect match for you. Because what I really like about Brilliant is you learn by doing it. With thousands of interactive lessons covering maths, programming, data analysis and AI, the courses that Brilliant provide help you improve your critical thinking skills by using an interactive problem-solving approach. You're not just memorising information, you're actually putting it into practice, which helps you understand it more clearly and in the end helps you become a better thinker. Brilliant allows you to build real knowledge in just minutes a day by breaking these courses down into small manageable lessons, making completing them really easy. The growing number of programming courses that Brilliant have to offer is an excellent way to learn how to build real-world applications. If you're a complete beginner or need a refresher, you can start by learning the essentials from variables and loops to nesting and conditionals. And you can learn these essential principles in a completely no-code conceptual way. As you progress through these lessons, you'll develop your mind to think more like a programmer and start to begin writing more complex programs to build apps and even games. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash robsmithdev, scan the QR code or follow the link in the video description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thank you Brilliant for sponsoring this video. So, bringing the Rock Knight onto the bench, and, well, first I'm going to check to see if there's no hidden secrets hiding in the plug. So we'll get that open. Nope, no surprises in there, so onto the main unit. And, well, it's held together by four screws underneath, so let's get them out. Well, this thing is tightly held together. Oh, there we go. OK, I'll zoom in a little here for a closer look. First, we have some kind of speaker or buzzer, where the beeps are coming from, obviously, I guess. Looks like it was once glued down many years ago. Let's see if I can get some of that off there. The cable comes in here at the back and it's glued in. A little isopropanol will fix that and hopefully help with the not so sticky tape as well. And just need to remove this screw here. And there we go, the cable's disconnected. Next, I'm gonna disconnect the buzzer and try to get some more of that glue off. Well, I guess I'm not massively surprised. It's all just basic logic chips. Now, I'm guessing the ones here are producing the track display on the front, whereas the rest of the chips are handling the rest of the logic. But there's only one way to find out, and that's to reverse engineer it. And this may take some time. OK, so I've not reverse engineered it completely. I don't need to. I don't really care about how it generates the track display on the front. But for those interested, these chips here, the SN74LS192, are BCD, that's binary coded decimal, up down counters. And these two here are the 74LS47N, are BCD to seven segment decoders. And these are both controlled by the 74LS14 and the 74LS27, which are SMIT trigger inverters and triple input NOR gates. Without these six chips, the only functionality you'd actually lose is the track counter display. So, onto the remaining chips, but first, the floppy drive signals. The left hand side represents the plug and the cable that you connect to the Amiga, and the right hand side is the signals presented at the connector on the back of the Rock Knight. You'll notice that all of the signals but one pass through completely unaffected. 
This signal labelled DKWE or Disk Write Enable is what's connected to the write gate pin on the floppy drive, which enables the writing. And given what our tests showed, it makes sense that the signal is broken here and put under control of the rest of the circuit. The signals I've marked on the right hand side are used by the Rock Knight to control its logic. The rest aren't needed. Now showing the schematic with just the outlines for the chips isn't very helpful, so I've broken them down into their individual logic gates. And believe it or not, it's not actually as daunting as it first looks. We'll start with these sections here that look identical, and they are. We'll take a closer look at just one of these. It all starts off with a push switch here, which goes into this simple filter here. That helps to prevent switch bouncing noise. Then it goes into this block, which is known as a flip-flop. Each time a pulse is applied to the CLK or clock input, which happens as a result of you pressing the button, the current state of the input D is copied to the output Q. Looking below Q, you see Q bar or not Q. This signal is always the opposite of Q, and as it's connected to the input D, each time you press the button, it causes Q to toggle between on and off. This small, simple circuit is responsible for turning on and off the virus and protect operations. The outputs coming from the not Q signal is fed to the next part of the circuit. So let's have a look at that. See, it's already looking less complex without the flip-flop logic shown. I'll try to start with something simple. Now, these NOT gates are actually not normal NOT gates. They're actually what are called open collector NOT gates. This means when their output is high or logic 1, it actually just floats, and it really isn't connected to anything. However, when it's zero, it's strongly pulled to ground. Now, there should be a pull-up resistor here, and I would have thought there would be one, so maybe I've missed it. All of the input signals are actually active when they're at logic zero, because this is all negative logic. So, if you map out the truth table for these three gates, you can see that it's actually behaving like an OR gate. Yes, I know it seems a little bit strange, but the logic kind of works in reverse when it's negative. Note that the buzzer here on the output will only sound if it gets a logic zero, meaning it will only make a sound if we're trying to write to a disc and we're currently on track zero. So that's the audible part out the way, making this circuit simpler by the minute. Next up, let's have a look at the write protect signal here. The write protect signal is another open collector type signal, so either of the two NOT gates just before it can trigger it to go low. Moving along to these NOR gates. NOR gates can be a little bit confusing, especially with negative logic, so I'll make another truth table for each of them, starting with the first one. And as you can see, the output from pin 6 here will only change to high when all three inputs are low, i.e. when we're on track 0 and the virus button is enabled. In this state, because of the NOT gate here, this would drive the write protect signal low, faking the disk being write protected. We'll call this output virus track 0. Let's have a look at the NOR gate below it, once again with another truth table. And from this we can see that the output is only driven high when the protect button is enabled and the first drive, DF1, is selected. This feeds into another NOT gate and makes the disk appear write protected. And this does indeed match what we saw. I'm going to call this output protect cell 1. Now if we use those new names we can simplify the diagram and there really isn't much left. So we'll write out our final truth table. And with that we can see that the only time the disk write enable output is ever driven low is when the computer is actually trying to write to the disk and the protect button isn't pressed while the drive is selected. And finally, when we're not on track zero with the boot block virus blocking enabled. Simple, eh? Yeah, I know, the negative logic makes this really more complicated than it feels like it should be. But anyway, that's how it works. And there you have it. Sporting an Amiga Bill sticker, the Rocktech Rock Knight. Sounds like something that belongs to the Flintstones, doesn't it? Anyway, for the internal device, it's as bad as the cheapo device I had before. But for the external device, it's actually perfect, and it does exactly what it claims to. I can't imagine I'll have much use for it, to be honest, although it does kind of function as a floppy drive extension cable, I suppose. Anyway, I hope you found that interesting. If you did, you know what to do. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.